Shalom Chavrim. Uh, greetings and a pleasure to get to come and speak with you guys again. And uh, if you did not get a chance to listen to Shabbat Live uh, this past Friday, you should really catch that in archive. Uh, Brother Jason, I, I told him uh, beforehand I really wanted to go back and review uh, the, the whole uh, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. I told him we had done that here on YouTube and uh, that I would really love to just go into that teaching there on uh, Shabbat Live, the program that he hosts there that we're a guest on. And uh, so we did. And it was a blessing. I, I actually need to go back and play it myself. Uh, there were things the Lord revealed that I had not heard before. And uh, so I was learning as I was going. But unfortunately for me, when a revelation is given, that is something that God places inside of your heart and your soul. And, and it's the Holy Spirit in you that feeds on that revelation. And so therefore, I generally have no idea of knowing what is actually being, um, uh, or, or I, I, and other than it just passes through my mind briefly, I, I don't have any other way to pick up that that revelation there. So I don't get to hear everything, and so it's a little little discouraging. I, I want to remember it, but then I'll end up forgetting it. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's, uh, let me mute the volume on this other computer here so I don't end up with a lot of noises going off in the background. Um, one thing, let me just kind of take you back. This was in chapter 10, and I'd mentioned this to you guys uh, in the last teaching on this, but I'd like to just go back and look at this a little bit. Chapter 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall um, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as we spoke about, that was the name of Hashem. That's the divine name of God. And as I mentioned to you how Paul is associating God himself as Yeshua. Uh, it's very interesting because then he goes on to say, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, it was not, wasn't a question whether or not the Jews of their day believed that uh, Hashem was God. They believed that emphatically. But they did not believe that Yeshua was sent of God. And uh, so that's where the confusion came in. I'd gotten a message on, uh, gosh, I don't know where exactly where it was. And someone had asked me about the Trinity. And for, just for the sake of those that have never maybe heard me speak about this before, you know, there are many Trinitarians that have a solid revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And he is God manifested in flesh. Uh, God is a triune being, just like we are a triune being. We are both soul, body, and spirit. But my spirit cannot be someone else. And neither can my body be someone else separate from me, and neither can my soul be someone else. Now, yes, this body will go in the dust and die. You know, that's true. But God is, is very much like we are in that respect there. So when God created us in the image of Him, He created us a three-part type of being. Uh, so I don't normally use the, the terminology three persons, although God can manifest himself any way he chooses to manifest himself. He manifests himself as a Shekinah glory. He is the Ruach HaKadosh. And any Jew would tell you, ask him, what is the Ruach HaKadosh? Is this some other person? No, it is God's spirit. It is Hashem's spirit. We don't look at it as two different people, see? But... It's, so it's not, it's not like the, I know the, uh, I was asked if I was apostolic. No, I am a Jewish person that believes that Yeshua is Messiah, but I'm trying, even for, the, for my Christian brothers and sisters, I'm trying to help bring that balance in to, so you understand who God really is. See, God himself became a human being. He became salvation. That's why his name is Yahshua, Yahshua. Yahshua is that is the divine name of God, and it's the word salvation, Shua, Yahshua. Just like it says in Isaiah 42, there is no Savior beside me. No, I know not any, and I know there never shall be. 
Now, if God emphatically says there never shall be a Savior beside him, then if Yeshua sits at the right hand of God, what is he saying then? See, he is, it is the power, it is the salvation, it is the work of grace. That's the right hand. So, anyway, without getting too drawn out into that, I want to kind of clarify that just a little bit for you guys. In other words, what I would say to make it simple, and this is what's written even in the Tanakh by the, by the rabbis, God is, when it says Elohim, Elohim is a plural, is a plural, plural suffix, and the reason for that is because God can manifest himself in multiple ways. He was a man that spoke to Abraham in a human body. He was Melchizedek. Melchizedek had neither father nor mother nor beginning of days or ending of life. That's why Yeshua is, a, is after the order of Melchizedek. See, because he is a type of who Melchizedek is. The difference was, in this case, God created in Mary that, you know, she conceived. Now, you got to keep in mind, this is not, this is her DNA and God creating his own DNA to bring forth a child. Because why? He had to be a man. If he wasn't a kinsman, if it was not Mary's egg there, he was not a kinsman. If everything is just created, then God had no need for a womb. He had to be a kinsman. In fact, Ron Wyatt, uh, who discovered uh, uh, a brown substance on the ark inside, uh, he'd found the ark of the covenant, and this is, and I believe it to be so. Uh, I know there's a lot of people dispute things about Ron Wyatt, but I, I have to support uh, some of the findings, at least that I've researched on. It only stands to reason that the ark of the covenant was under Golgotha, because the mercy seat had to be sprinkled with the blood of the lamb. In order for there to be atonement, that mercy seat had to be sprinkled. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but because I've, I've not been able to verify this as of yet, but I, I read recently that there were about eight or nine different rabbis that tried to remove the ark from that cave up underneath there, uh, under Golgotha, and I, I hear it said that they all passed away in trying to do so, so they finally ceased. Whether or not that's true or not, I'm not really sure. I've not been able to confirm that, but it is something interesting to, to look at, and I would like to know more about that. Uh, so anyway, if you happen to know anything about it, let me know. In fact, I, I do know uh, Ron Wyatt's uh, late wife, Mary Neil Wyatt uh, Lee, uh, a remarkable, remarkable sister, very precious lady indeed, uh, as well as uh, his good friend, Vivica Pontian, another precious sister uh, in the Lord. Know them both uh, very well, and... Uh, Many times. In fact, we have an interview somewhere on our YouTube channel. If you go back, you can find an interview I did with the two of those uh, sisters together. It was a, an enjoyable time with my wife and uh, my family and their family. Uh, we really enjoyed the time we had with them up in Tennessee when we were up there one time. Anyhow, let's get back to this. I'm sorry for getting sidetracked there. Uh, and how shall they preach? Oh, this is what I want to bring out to you. Uh, verse 14 again. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now you have to remember, Israel's eyes and hearing is closed. God blinded them. And he, the Bible says that they're here, they would be dull of hearing. So, But there has to be a restoration and this is why the scripture says, and how shall they hear without a preacher? This is prophetic is what this is. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay. Now, this is, this is in my opinion, this is your ministry of your two witnesses. Uh, but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, uh, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, they, their sound went out into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and a foolish nation, I will, ang I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, 
He saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now see, Paul is setting the stage, and this is what's really important for those that think replacement theology is correct when it's not correct. Paul is setting that stage for us to let us know that Yes, there are scriptures that apply. Yes, that there are scriptures that show that we were cast off and that we were rejected. But notice, he keeps bringing in all those scriptures that show these things are for a reason. To provoke Israel to jealousy. Now we come into Romans chapter 11. And by the way, before I get into Romans 11, let me make one other uh, announcement that I'm working on as well. We still have not finished with our Vatican series. That's true. Uh, we're still working on that, uh, and uh, I still have got to get a few more videos over to Brother Chris. I found some in YouTube where you guys had sent me and that I'd saved several people that sent back originally uh, for the Unconditionally We Stand With Israel, so I've just really been backed up. Uh, I wasn't feeling well the other day, but uh, trying to get some of these things caught up with. And another thing, and it's, I don't really want to call it a series, but I'm, I've really been felt passionately on my heart to go back and actually teach. I've never really taught from the Gospels, but specifically from the Gospel of John. Uh, we went and caught the movie the other day, um, The Son of God, the one that just came out recently in theaters there. Uh, and the Lord just dealt with me on several things. I mean... <laughs> It's just like reading the Bible for me. As I begin to hear things, the Lord just begins to pour into me revelation after revelation. And one thing I shared with Sister Julia today that I found very interesting, very profound, was um, uh, she had sent me a message on, on Facebook there. and We had chatted back, back and forth a little bit. Um, and when I saw in the movie, and I've seen this many times over, but then the Lord dropped a revelation in my heart that I never knew before. And that was, uh, they showed the scene where Simon is request, or told to carry the cross for Yeshua. And when he does, of course, Simon was a black man. Now, how I, I don't really know the history behind that of how that's known, but I, that's, I've always heard that, I've always believed it, that he was a black man. And then once this black brother took that cross of Yeshua, the moment I saw it, the Holy Spirit fell upon me. And then I realized why the, the black people in the United States, when their ancestors first were brought over to the U.S. as slaves, why they suffered so hard. You know, it was as if what God was doing 2,000 years ago he was showing a sign before it ever happened. He showed how that they would bear, the, as, as their ancestor, as Simon their ancestor, bore that cross. It was foreshadowing that even they would suffer. They would bear that cross of shame and humility. And the, and the, and the black race, just like the Jewish race, you know, we suffered so hard in, in slavery and in bondage in our people. And it's, it's something that I believe is one reason why you see the two communities, uh, the Jewish community and, and a lot of the, um, the African-American community, a lot of times they, they, they bond well together because we both come from a past that's very similar. We both, our peoples were enslaved and in bondage. And when I saw this scene of this man carrying this cross for Yeshua, I could not help, as the Holy Spirit come upon me in this theater, I could not help but realize God was showing that they would suffer tremendously. What it would take for the gospel to be brought to them would be the agony and the suffering. And certainly, as the African-American people came to the United States as slaves and everything, you know, it, it, it is true that the gospel came to them from, from, they came from a tribal background, that is true, from their native countries and everything. And yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua, was revealed to them here in the United States. But under, under the, the revelation of who Yeshua was, they were carrying that load, that burden of Jesus Christ. They were carrying his cross. 
and they were suffering as he suffered in order to receive the gospel of Yeshua. And when I saw that, I could not, I mean, my heart just went out for the, for the African American, for, for, the, for the black race and the sufferings that they have gone through to receive the gospel of Yeshua, even in Africa today, not just the African Americans, but the, but the, but the black people in Africa, down in, in, in South Africa, an, another place, for example, you know, many of them have come to know Yeshua as, South, as Savior as well. But what have they always done their, in their whole life? They bore that burden of the cross. And so I saw that in Simon's life, that he reflected his people. Just as we see with the Jewish people, our, we, we, I see constantly how God, we're, our lives are reflected. We, we've suffered, you know, and, and, and like even more recently in our own time when Hitler had us for slave labor in Europe and, and, and before Hitler it was the pogroms. I mean, Israel has gone... Sometimes we look at it as we say, okay, we were in bondage for Egypt for 400 years. You know, really and truly, though, the Jews, have, we, have, we have never been able to seem to break free from the bondage of slavery. It's just in modern days. I mean, even, even the African-American people and, and, and the African people over in Africa, the same problem there, you know, the apartheid. I mean, it was in modern era that they finally begin to get some freedom. So we have a very similar past, and, and, and my heart is out to these people. And I say, God bless you. And I understand more now why you have gone through what you've gone through, because God showed it right in his word that this is what it would take to bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ to your people. So, and un Fortunately for Israel, we still have suffering ahead for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be made known to our people. So I would ask you, as, as the African uh, community around the world, the, the black brothers and sisters around the world, and if, and if I say something wrong, I don't mean to offend no one. I, I don't know the, the etiquette things. You just know that I love you, and that's what's important. I love you. I have many black brothers and sisters that to listen to these videos here, and I've never addressed you personally like this, but I just ask you, as fellow brothers and sisters, knowing that you come from a past of such hardship in your families, remember the Jewish people, because we still have a rough road to go. And we just ask your prayers, and ask, and sincerely, because I know the, 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 the black people are some of the most you get a good Christian like that, boy, they pray harder than anybody I know of. So we love you and we thank you and God bless you. Um, all right, I'll get going into uh, Romans 11 here. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, who, who, which he foreknew. What you not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession of God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. By the way, for those of you that do not know, in, in the Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, if uh, a woman were to say my husband, she would say Bali. It's the same word for Baal, Baal, Bali. Uh, it's typically translated as master. Uh, in, in the English language, you'll find it in the, in, in the Bible where you see, uh, in fact, there's one scripture that says, uh, God says, you will no longer, they shall no longer call me my master, but they shall call me my husband, and then they, the Hebrew word they use there is ishi. Now, ishi is what uh, God called Adam when he first created Adam. He never called him Adam. Adam. He was, it wasn't when he formed him from Adama, from the dust of the ground, but he was called ish. Ish is that the divine fire of God. And so when 
God says here, you will no longer call me Bali, and they translate that my master, literally it's my husband, but you will call me Ishi. And they say, that is my husband. Do you realize the reason why God does that differently there? This is when Israel receives the Holy Ghost. Because the Ishi, the Ish, the Yod, the Sheen, the Aleph, the, Sh the Aleph Yod Sheen, it's spelled like that, Aleph Yod Sheen. It's like a little X, a little bit of a funny X, a little, the Yod, and then the Sheen is like a W, all right? That's what, that's what the word Ish looks like. Now, here's what's fascinating about that. When you spell that out, the middle letter is the Yod for the divine name of God, and then the Aleph and the Sheen, the little thing that looks like an X and a little thing that looks like a W, if you put that together, that makes the word fire. So it's the fire of Hashem, or the Holy Ghost. What did the Bible say in, on the day of Pentecost? There were cloven tongues like a fire that rested upon each one of them. It was the image. It was, in other words, it was the it was like a pillar of fire. It came down, and and Paul was trying to describe what it looked like. So, it, like a tongue is kind of rounded. That's what it looked like. And it was little licks of fire that rested on each one of them. So when God says, "You don't call me no more Bali, you call me Ishi," He's showing you they received the Holy Ghost. That's what's going to happen. All right. So, sorry, I got a little sidetracked again. Uh, all right, verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise works is no more work. What then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Hmm. See, the elected ones, those that were called of God before the world ever began, they got it. And then the rest, they were just blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. So remember what we spoke about earlier? Um, where was that? How shall they hear without a preacher? All right. So, see, the thing is, right now their, their hearing has been stopped. Their, their sight has been stopped. So the, in verse 15 of chapter 10, it's prophetic. It's for a future date, for a future remnant. Because you have to understand, the ones that were not part of the remnant, they were blinded. But God promised there would be a remnant even from their loins. So now does it make sense why then? It's prophetic. And how shall they preach except they be sent? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But notice here verse 14. Uh, midway through, and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, he's actually speaking, he's, he's looking in the future at the Jews, the remnant of the Jews that would be the descendants of the ones that clearly he shows didn't believe it. Okay, because that's where we're at now. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit, back up verse 7, this is chapter 11, what then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. You understand that when, it's, when he's saying the election have obtained it, in other words, those that God foreknew were going to believe when he came, they got it. That was all the, the 12 apostles, that was the others that, you know, that stayed right with him. That was those early Christians that were all Jewish. That's the election. Then he says here, and the rest were blinded. Now, if the rest are blinded, but we clearly see that there's going to be a time, because um, if you go back up to verse 4, but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men and have not bowed the knee into, into the, uh, to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, now that brings you up to there. 
but the rest are blinded. But we're going to find out around verse 25, there's still coming a time where they're going to see again. There's still going to be a remnant saved. And that's why it's prophetic over in chapter 10 of, of Romans here in verse 14 when he talks about there being a preacher sent. And how are they going to be able to hear? See, why? Because their ears are shut, their eyes are blinded, and it's going to stay that way until he sends that preacher. And then, according to the preacher, it says, are, how beautiful are the feet of them. Why? There's two. And I know many people have always applied that prophecy to the, the preachers down through the Christian age. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly okay. Because truly, preachers have preached the gospel and they brought it to those that, that, that did not hear. But the problem is, oh wow, when you really look at Romans, Romans is not quite as it seems to be. This is really dealing with Israel. This is what Paul, I mean, Paul is showing, he, he literally separates Jew and Gentile here. And that's what he's doing here. So in reality, the prophecy is to Israel. That's what it's for. All right, let's, let's continue on. Chapter 11 here, okay. We read verse uh, 8, slumbered eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Verse 9, and David saith, let their table be a snare and, and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all the way. See? Now what's, I mean, David's talking about their sufferings. That they would be beaten. Verse 11, I say that have they stumbled that they should fall. God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, what are we looking at when we're looking at the jealousy here? What are we looking at when, when he talks about that it's, you know, through their fall? Do you realize that when, when uh, Joseph's brothers sinned against Joseph, you know, it looked like the evilest thing that they could have ever done. Take their brother just because he's spiritual and throw him in a ditch and then sell him out. See, but the thing is, is all of this was the hand of Almighty God. In fact, when Joseph goes down into Egypt, the Gentiles that are there have no idea that God has anointed them to prepare the gospel, so to speak, for his brethren. The food and the grain and this, everything is stored up and is put in the garners. Yes, it was all, it was to feed the Gentiles. They had everything they had need of. In fact, they were all cared for first. But finally, Joseph's brethren came and then they were fed as well. From the same corn, the same blessing. And no doubt, they come here, they see Egypt, and, and, and they got everything. Famine in the land, but these people aren't lacking anything. I'm still trying to figure out what it is in Christianity that's going to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Um, it's Jesus Christ to realize that they missed him. You know, I mean, if you think about jealousy, God says, I am a jealous God. He's jealous over his wife. And normally, you think about this, you know, when, when well, I'll skip that for now. I say then, have they stumbled? That they should fall, God forbid, as we just read. Rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? See? So there's still a future for Israel. Their fall brought salvation, but their restoration brings their fullness. So God's got to complete his word. For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the re reconciling of the world, 
what shall receive, receiving of them be but life from the dead? Beautiful. Mm. There's your house of Israel. Remember the prophecy over in, Zach, uh, excuse me, in Ezekiel? Dry bones, can these bones live again? I did a video on that several years back about how that the, uh, even when it talks about the open valley, I believe that that was the ditches in the Holocaust. And yet most of that prophecy actually speaks of the house of Israel, not just the house of Judah. Most Jews in the house of Judah were, were killed and condemned during uh, from the house of Judah, but yet there were mixed in there some of the house of Israel as well. Now, okay, uh, verse 15, for the casting away of them to be reconciling of the world, okay, but life from the dead. Verse 16, for as the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and, be, and, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be thou, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward, the, toward thee goodness if thou continue in, goodness, in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, and to the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now see, that's a, that's a serious statement right there. And Jesus himself says something very similar to that as well. There is a time, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. In other words, the time when the time comes and the time ends for the Gentiles. Not to say that we're not talking about tribulation, but see, so you have to understand, Daniel's 70th week begins at the start of, I mean, that's, the, that's this last seven years. It's, and it applies to Israel. That's when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does he mean? God, in other words, he's turning his heart back to the Jews. And then the Jewish people are going to receive the gospel, not only the house of Judah, but the house of Israel as well. They've never heard him. And so there's got to come a time where they will hear. And I think we're going to see a huge Aliyah movement in the very not-so-distant future. I have a feeling it's going to be just like it was for the Jewish people that started the nation in 1948. The Holocaust is what forced the Jews back home. We may see a Holocaust against the house of Israel this time around, and that will force her back home. So my brother, Benjamin Netanyahu, prepare to open the borders for the house of Israel. She's coming home. Um, let's conclude this now. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Sion or Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. That's Daniel chapter 9. You can't get around it. It's also a Isaiah 27, 9 as well. Um, when I shall take away their sins. Um, in fact, let me read to you real quick Isaiah. Uh, you know, sometimes it really behooves you, especially when you got these. You get, you get whoever the scholars were that really went back and did all their homework uh, and did their research. It sure it helps you a lot to be able to go back and 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 see these things. It's such a blessing for us. Uh, you know, I mean, especially if you take the time. To go in there 
Uh, you know, my wife brought up something, and I know I've mentioned it to you guys before, but I just, well, she was listening to uh, a gentleman on a video recently, and he mentioned how that, um, he said, Isaiah, I think it's 2815, where it talks about Israel's made a covenant with death, and this brother said, that's the Vatican. And I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, you mean to tell me you haven't been listening to these videos? I said, I, I said the same thing. I, and the funny thing was, I actually had forgot I'd spoke about that until I looked it up myself. That's over, like I said, 2815. I'll read 14 too. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, are, are, we, are we at agreement? And with the overflowing scourge shall pass through. It shall not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Uh, and I would marked that in my Bible, and I put on their covenant with the Vatican. That's exactly what the leaders of Israel think they're doing. They think that they're making this covenant with the Vatican, which is with death. Romans have always represented death. And they think that this is going to save them? No. Remember, peace, peace, and there is no peace. So anyway, just thought I'd bring that up real quick to you. Uh, 2709. Um, this, is, this is a beautiful passage is here. Um, yeah, I've marked this here. Uh, I want to back up a little bit, though, and this is to verse 6. Uh, Israel shall blossom and bud, and the face of the world shall be filled with fruit. Has he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? Or has he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him, by measure, by exile? And thou didst contend with them. He removed her by his rough blast in the day of the east wind. Uh, by this, therefore, shall the iniquity of, of Jacob be atoned. See, he has smitten, notice again, he, uh, has he smitten him? He smit those that smote him. My Jewish brothers think about that. He smote us. See? Has he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? This is why we've gone through this. This is why. So anyway, that transgression. In fact, that is the answer to our transgression. If we look at Daniel, you know, to finish the transgression, to bring an end of sin, well, there's the answer. This, what did we do wrong? See? Enter, uh, excuse me, what did we do wrong? Has he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? If God tells us that we smote him, and you know, brother, listen here, this is not, this is not from a Christian translation, this is our own translation right here. We wrote in here, he has smitten us as we smote him. Or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? By measure, by exile, thou didst contend with them. And he removed her by his rough blast in the days of the east wind. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be atoned. What is that rough blast, that east wind? That was when he parted the Red Sea. Yam Suf. With the blast of his nostrils. And the same wind that he used to part the sea, he used to scatter us across the world. Because of our own iniquity. We should think about it. At any rate, the prophecy of the Christian Bible is that we come back. Just as it is in the Jewish Bible. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved of the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as you in time past have not believed God, yet have now, yet have now ob obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the 
riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. You know, I just, I got to go back. There's one thing I saw there, and I just want to go back and look at it again. Uh, even so, they also not, now not believe that through your mercy they also may have known eternal faith. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them. That wasn't it either. Hmm. Anyway, forget exactly. I saw something, but I have to go back and look at that. Uh, anyway, God bless you. We love you, and I thank you uh, for listening. I also want to thank you for those of you that are, are helping us make ready for this trip to Israel. Uh, it is a blessing. In fact, I hope the audio quality is a little different here. Uh, there was a sister that helped us get uh, new equipment for the trip, and uh, so we're trying that out right now. So God bless you, Sister Lisa, for that, uh, and many others that have, that have come forward. Um, my wife gives me the list of things we still have to accomplish. So uh, I, it's like I told her, I said, God knows every need, and he will take care of every little thing. There won't be one thing left undone. And we see everything that you guys are doing. And we thank you so much. And I know God sees it as well. I think we're going to see a mighty move of God in Israel in the next few weeks. Who knows what he will do? Be praying for us though. I need it. My family needs it. The miracle of all of our passports coming in. If you had, you have no idea what we went through over this passport, but it was a miracle of God that we were able to get everybody's passports up to date or new ones for the first time, and they were challenged constantly. Um, so many blessings. Uh, God bless you. I love you guys. Good night.